Thank you. All right, good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is going to be a quicker conversation uh, because I've sort of just uh, pulled Professor Merotra out of his evening to have a quick chat so he could clarify something for us. There are GDP, provisional GDP numbers that have come out for the quarter ended June. So this is April, May, June this year. Um, and it says India has, India's GDP has grown by 20%, which is fantastic. I mean, uh, that's great to know. And a lot of people are celebrating on Twitter, but somehow those of us, you know, we don't really feel like we're a country that's growing at 20%, right? Something is off. So if you take a closer look at the numbers, we have to understand how GDP is calculated. So GDP for the quarter ended June 2020 is compared to GDP of the same quarter last year. Now, what were we doing in the same quarter last year? We dropped 24%, which is the highest drop that we had ever seen, right? So compared to that, minus 24%, we've moved up 20%. So effectively, are we still in minus 4% territory? So to just understand if this is in fact reason to celebrate, and that would be great. It means that we won't be losing jobs, that uh, you know, that we won't be struggling to make many, many families won't be moving further into poverty. I just asked Professor Merothra to spare some time to help us understand. So here he is right now. Um, should we celebrate? Is this good news? Professor, it's good news, but I mean, how are you going to celebrate if you are actually still lower than where you were in 1920 in the same quarter? I'm saying 1920, still much lower, 10 percentage point, 10 percent lower than where you were in 1920. The first wave during the first wave of COVID. Oh, in 1920, I'm okay. not talking about 2021. First, first wave. The, the same quarter last year is 2021, which is April, May, June of 2020. That's what, the, it, because the base was so low then, it contracted, as you rightly began by telling us, at 23.4%, at which was the worst contraction that any economy in the world had suffered. So let's not congratulate ourselves about the worst contraction that we had already suffered a year ago. And therefore, because of the low base, we've now grown at the fastest rate that any other country has grown. Well, what is the net net? The net net is that you are not just below April to June of 2020. You are 10% below the level of 1920, the same quarter. So let me give you the absolute in lakh crores. In lakh crores, the GDP in this same quarter two years ago was 35.6. In this quarter, this has come out to be 32.4. That's a clear more than four, four lakh crores, less than two years ago in this quarter. So, uh, this just starting. I haven't finished. I'm okay. going to, I'm going no, to no. So before before you go further, to, to understand, to help our audience understand, see if I have understood this clearly, because at the same time last year we had done so badly. In comparison, we seem to be improving. But if we were to compare ourselves to two years ago, so you skip that bad one and you compare it to two years ago, we're actually ten percent lower than we were two years ago. It actually gives us an understanding that it's not reason to celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're twelve percent. In fact, twelve percent below nineteen twenty, and twelve percent below nineteen twenty. Two points need to be added to this to understand the real impact of the last two years, one and a half years. One is that in this same period, two-year period, the population has grown by one percent per annum. So per capita income is much lower now in this quarter than it was two years ago. Point one. Point two, we were at least growing in 1920, right? We were growing at, at a very slow place the, for the nine quarters prior to COVID. The economy had been slowing. So the, because of the slow, slowness of the growth, there was uh, the point is the trajectory was down. However, the growth trajectory was down. It was still positive territory. Had we maintained that trajectory for the next two years, compare that, compare now to that, we are way below what we could have or should have been. Suppose we grew at only 4% as we grew in 1920. 
we could have then be, been at something like 40 lakh crores. What are we at? We are at 32 lakh crores. So let's keep both these things in mind as well. And I haven't even mentioned the third thing as to who's suffering. It's the people at the bottom of the pyramid who are suffering. The organized sector firms, the listed companies have made the highest profits in the, in the last financial year, 2021, that they had made in the last seven years. Yes. This is one of the reasons why the stock markets are booming. Also, Prof Professor, we have to talk about how they made those profits. Right? They made those profits by cutting costs, not by growing their businesses. You're absolutely right. They cut their input costs fell because they cut jobs. And the, the Sarkari data tells us what happened to uh, organized sector jobs, to formal sector jobs. There was a reversal in, there was a decline in regular jobs. There was a decline in formal jobs, meaning those with come with social security in this period. And so the input costs came down and clearly what you have is highest profits. And highest profits also show up then in growth. Profits show up in growth. So this is the overall picture. This is the overall. The, the argument that we will hear by tomorrow morning is look at the Sensex, which you touched upon. Now, if you look at the Sensex, in fact, it ended today 57,552, which is a which is a high uh, for a while. It's it's a one month high, really. It's just, it's also a six. It's interestingly a six month high. I can explain. Let me explain that. Yes. As to why there is such a terrible disconnect. This first of all. This is a disconnect, not just in our country, it's a yes. disconnect in the US as well. So I have to explain then as to why there is this disconnect. First of all, in order to revive their economy, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank and, and the Japanese Central Bank have all lowered their already low um, interest rates. They've lowered this. In other words, there's a lot of money available to be borrowed and people are borrowing. So there's a lot of liquidity. And pension funds, insurance funds, they are all liquid. And they are flooding this liquidity into emerging market economies because the differential between uh, the prices and the exchange rate enables them to earn much more in emerging market economies. And India is a big economy, so it's benefiting from this, point one. This is one major reason what, what is driving. The second major reason I've already hinted at is the fact that the profitability of listed companies, companies listed on Nifty as well as Sensex, is the highest in 2021 compared to the preceding six years. So in, in seven years, this is the highest profit, profits. So prof, corporate profits show up in earnings of those who have stocks. So that's what's showing up, point two, point three. Those who have organized sector jobs and have stable jobs, whether you are in the government or in the private corporate list sector, please understand that they're staying at home. They're not going out. For this, a very significant part of this year, their transport costs have fallen. Two, they're not going on holidays. Three, they're not going out to eat. So what are they doing? They have savings. They have built up savings. How are they going to use this saving? Well, obviously they see that the, that the stock market is the best place. So what have you seen? We've seen an unprecedented rise in retail investors in our stock markets. One million new retail investors were joining as retail investors every month for the last 15 months. This is unprecedented. So it's not just that the you know, foreign portfolio investors are flooding our stock market with money, but our own relatively better off, the upper middle class, the upper class are investing yes. 
and that's also pumping the liquidity in. Into so the uh, let me let me ask you another uh, counter question, if I may. Uh, GDP, the GST collections, and this is the latest headline, GST collections for the month of July crossed 1 lakh crore. It was the second highest this fiscal. GST uh, mop-up grew by 33% year on year in July. Now, we could argue that if GST collections are moving up, which means people are buying and selling, people are manufacturing, businesses moving. Is that an argument that you would buy? Yes, yes, of course. If that you explain the reason why GST is doing okay. Obviously, the organized sector is doing fine, by and large, by and large. Some segments of the organized sector are affected very badly, especially contact services have been affected very badly. And by and large, manufacturing is not so not doing so uh, uh, not doing so well either. But you know, there are some large companies, especially in the FMCG sector, uh, the e-commerce business, all those are doing very fine. Thank you very much. They are, they are laughing their way to the bank, which is partly showing up in the stock market. And um, uh, so one has to take into account that phenomenon also. I mean, I have to tell you, there is a bit of good news, which is the following, that the one sector which affects the poor and the migrant labor the most, which is the construction sector, that has shown very, that has shown very significant growth. Uh, the gross value added in the construction sector in this quarter was as high as 68%. It's 68% high, higher than the previous year at the same quarter. But keep this in mind that in the previous quarter, it had the construction sector had contracted by 47%. Huh? Millions of workers, migrant workers had gone back. This time, the lockdown was not so severe, thank God. And therefore, millions did not go back. So despite the fact that the second wave was on, many construction work uh, sites resumed work at a lower level, but then they also picked up in obviously later part of May and in June. That's what you are seeing, uh, construction sustained. And please remember, these are construction workers who had gone back home. Some of them had come back. They had suffered a significant decline in incomes by going back home. So obviously they came, came back home with the hope of, you know, making up. So they showed up for work. So if construction employers were available and builders were willing to build, then the workers were there, desperate, despite the fact that they might have been, might be being paid wages lower now than they were being paid earlier. Because what is clear, what is clear for this quarter from the government's own uh, periodic labor force survey, which covered this same quarter, meaning the quarter of April, May, June. Uh, uh, and I think we've talked about it on your show. Incomes fell in that quarter. Inevitably, wages fell. We know that. So employment fell in that quarter very significantly. In I'm talking about the quarter of April, May, June. Um, of, of, of this year. So, so that's the overall story. Construction is the only sector which is showing reasonable growth and on the strength of that, our chief economic advisor has no hesitation in telling the whole world that this is a V-shaped recovery. I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear you. I, I beg your pardon. I, I put myself on mute because my dog was barking. I apologize for that. Do you want to hazard what sort of recovery we're looking at right now? Is it K-shaped, W-shaped, V-shaped? Are we recovering at all in your opinion? Look, all that this is, is a rebound from what you saw in the, in the quarter a year ago. It's not a recovery. I think we demonstrated that in the first 10 minutes of your program. Uh, there's no reason to, to belabor that point. Second, I'm glad you've asked about the K shape as opposed to the V shape. I think I've hinted at that already, but let me elaborate on that. 
What does a K-shape mean? So K-shape means that there are some parts of the economy which are going up and some parts of the economy which are not staying where they were, it is going down. What is What are those parts? One, I think I've already hinted that the organized sector is doing better and, the, and has rebounded and the or unorganized sector, which, which did much worse earlier, is still not doing that much better at all. Secondly, within the organized sector, there are certain sectors which are doing fine. In the services, for instance, FMCG has picked up, e-commerce is dry, wherever e, 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 you know, FMCG products are being uh, supplied or food is being supplied through e-commerce business. So Swiggy Zomato, Amazon, Flipkart, etc. All those you know, com companies which are supplying to through Amazon, Flipkart, etc., they are doing fine. But what about the rest? Tourism is not. Airlines are not. Huh? Uh, hotels are not. Uh, transportation is suffering very deeply. You've done so many programs on this. Why? Because the government wishes to rake in revenues through excise on, cent mm -hmm. on, on, on uh, the central excise as well as the state VAT on petrol and diesel and of course on, on uh, LPG. This is totally unacceptable. So that actually brings me, Professor, to my next question, which was about inflation. Uh, the inflation number as of now stands at uh, 5.27 uh, in July. This is our uh, consumer price index. Now, explain to us how to understand this inflation number because we, I mean, Mengai, as people normally call it, we know it's hurting. Uh, it's hurting almost everybody. Gas cylinders have become more expensive. Vegetables have become more expensive. Electricity is more expensive. And of course, the, uh, the core of all of this is petrol and diesel. Uh, what does this mean at a time when this K-shaped thing is happening? Because the guys who are going up this way are not really going to be affected by the costs of the things I just called out. It's the ones who are going down this way. So if we have at this point a government that's celebrating recovery, they're actually blindsiding the ones who are sliding down. Right? They're pretending that that's not happening, You're which up. means that there's no help on the way. Unfortunately, there is no help on the way because the government, all it has done by way of a stimulus, most recently was the second wave, which was much more vicious than the first wave, was that they extended the, the rations. They extended the rations. That's all that has happened. Extending the rations is a drop in the bucket because what I didn't manage to say earlier is that joblessness is at a was already at a 48 year high in 2019-20. The government's own data is telling us this. And in the last 15 months that have elapsed since the break, break of COVID, Joblessness has only increased. If joblessness increases, then wages fall. When wages fall, consumption expenditure tends to get constrained. If that happens, you are not going to see sustained recovery of demand across the economy. If sustained recovery of demand does not happen, then do not expect after this rebound has occurred in this financial year, because we will not do as well as, you know, 20% in the next quarter, we'll do less. But overall, we may still end up with 9 to 10% growth in the fiscal year 21-22, which would take us still back only perhaps to 1920 GDP level overall at the end of the financial year, we'll have to wait to see whether we get a third wave, mm. how the economy behaves and so on and so on. So <clears throat> the big risk, Faye, as we move forward is the following, which I think don't think most people understand or, or recognize. Because if aggregate demand is getting compressed on account of, in, of increasing joblessness and 
and and um, and inflation and um, uh, rising poverty. I think you need to do a separate show. I've done recent estimates of what has happened to pre-COVID and post-COVID poverty. If with, with all of this in mind, what is going to happen over the next five years when we move into fiscal year 22, 23? In other words, this time next year. <clears throat> Are we going to get at least positive 5% growth over a next five year period from 22, 23 onwards? Possibly, we have to wait to see. But 5% is way below what this economy was doing until 2016 when the, you know, the bungling of the demonetization began. Right? You may blame the UPA for whatever. The fact of the matter is that the UPA average for a 10-year period, 8% growth, which came down to about 7 in the first two years of, of the Modi regime. But since then, it's down, been downhill. We cannot reduce poverty if we grow at 5% per annum. We massively reduce poverty during the period up to 15. Since then, the economy has been slowing and it has gone into contraction. The worst contraction that any economy suffered. Under that circumstances, if demand doesn't pick up, then the prospect of going back to 7 or 8% growth and forget $5 trillion economy is lost. That means all the young who are waiting for jobs cannot, cannot expect to get jobs. My students are already struggling and I'm trying to help them and yet they are struggling because the competition is up to here. It's like this. Yeah. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Marotha. You're right. We need to have a larger conversation about poverty. And for those of us in urban India who feel things are not that bad because the poverty is not happening to us, it doesn't matter. I want to remind you, it doesn't matter what business you're in. If the bottom of the pyramid gets kicked out, all businesses will collapse. You should have nothing to sell to. You'll have no one to sell to if the bottom, the chunk of the labor in our country, which is unorganized, are not making any money. And so they're unable to spend. We will have no one to park your businesses to. The other thing that we must remember is the, is the stock market is doing well and corporate India is doing well because they've saved a ton of money over the last year. Their offices have been closed. I mean, you know, a large, a large company saves a boatload of money on sugar because no one is making coffee in the office for a whole year. We were talking about not having to travel. Their executives are sitting at home. Everybody's meeting online. They've saved money. They've closed jobs. They've closed warehouses. They've closed uh, you know, various um, physical stores, for example, and they've found new ways to do things. As opposed to if corporate India is making money because it's growing, it means it will open new offices, it will open new showrooms, it will create new jobs. We're actually doing the reverse of that. And it looks great on the stock market, but over the long term, it might not be great for everyone because the poor will just continue to become poorer and poorer. And that's not a great picture to paint for the country in the whole over the long term. This is something we need to understand. Also, remember, our farmers are getting beaten up at you know, at toll nakas. What does this mean? It means agriculture has not recovered. It means farmers are dumping tomatoes on the road. They're still struggling. So that is a large chunk of our population. Also, many people who left the cities and went back to their villages said, Kiti karengi. we will just go back to farming. What does that mean? That means a piece of land that was feeding four people is now feeding seven people. It was not feeding four people very well to begin with. It will now feed seven people very badly. So we're pushing people further and further into poverty, taking them further back into history, in, as opposed to the reversal that we executed over the last 25 years in this country in education, in women's empowerment, in services, moving people from agriculture into the services industry. I remember when I was a young reporter, I was uh, working in Hyderabad and Andhra Pradesh, we would go into villages where farmers who could not read and write had children who were in France because they were working for IT companies. They'd done engineering and they were doing really well. That was the movement of India in the early 90s and the 200s. We're reversing that movement right now. And that's something that should worry it because we're not able to send farmers' kids to school and college and we're not able to build better futures for them. We need to learn more about this. My recommendation to our audience is to read. 
Read as many different voices as you can. Nobody says that you have to only believe the voice that you hear on this platform. Please read different voices and different opinions and make up your own mind. But it is something that should concern us all. And it's something we should demand better response from our government on. I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you all of you for listening in. Professor Marotra, as always, thank you for giving us your time. I deeply appreciate it. We will spend more time answering questions about the economy because it is the most important thing that's happening in our country. Thank you for watching. Good night.